Hello everybody, I'm here today with Sophie Zada to talk about body language. Now Sophie's from My Alchemy, an expert, and even though she doesn't want to be called an expert, <laughs> but she's an expert in the field of body language. So welcome Sophie, thank, thank you for coming you. along. Thanks for inviting me. You're most welcome. Um, now tell me a little bit about your background in body language and how you became involved in this field. Um, so I've always been in training, I've always worked within training and education. Um, I do have a little bit of a quirk in my career. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have had um, like two areas of passion, one being creativity and the other one body language. Um, and look, feel so lucky that I've worked in both of those areas. So for the first like 15 years of my career, I was actually a freelance artist and arts educator. Um, so part of my job was making commissions and the other part was training people. So I worked with all different types of people, you know, um, adults, children, special needs, you name it. I've worked with okay. different groups. Um, so I always had the training component and always loved training. Um, but of course, I love the creativity too. Um, and I actually I used to carve wood, so it was more sculptural rather than paintings. When I say I was an artist, most people assume that I paint. In fact, I've never painted until I actually moved to Australia. So, um, yeah, I've got a, a photograph of one of my pieces if you wanted to see Yeah, that, yeah, we'll have a one. look at that. Yeah. Um, so... That's this one. That's that one there. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, that one, um, that's actually in a permanent collection at Wolverhampton Art Gallery back in the UK. Okay. Um, and that was commissioned for um, a sensing sculpture gallery, which was aimed at visually impaired people. So my work isn't just about how it looks visually, it's about how it feels as well. Okay, so you can touch that? Yeah, so it's a small piece, you know, like it's tactile enough to be held in the hand. Okay, because I was thinking actually that looked quite large. So yeah, I was thinking it does, it's like sitting on no, a table. It's no, quite no, it's small. It's small. Yeah. Okay. It's based on a Chinese lantern, um, but it also has other sensory elements in there as well. So it's got, um, it was scented with scented oil um, and it's, it's hollow. So inside it, it contains a stone marble, so it rattles as well. All so right. it's got all of these different sensory elements. So it's got the tactile, the smell, the sound, as well as the visual. So, you know, um, this exhibition was specifically get aimed at visually impaired people. Um, I mean, I had always been interested in body language. I remember I knew I always wanted to do art, but my mum said, you know, you, there might not be that many jobs in art. You, know, <laughs> you have to back this up with something. Yeah. So, I studied psychology and sociology mm. at the same time. So I always had that passion, you know, I've always read popular science and popular psychology books, never novels, just all, I'm a bit of a nerd really, when it comes down to it. Um, so I, I always have had that interest, you know, I've always read about body language. Um, and then I saw the opportunity for um, certification from Science of People and they're a human behavioral research lab based in the US. So I went for that, studied really hard. Um, I got that actually last year. Um, so I mean, I did know a fair bit before I started. Um, and then of course I've been continuing to study ever since because I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> so from Sydney to Perth, how'd you end up over here in the West? So I quit that full-time job that I had as training manager mm -hmm. um, and came over to Perth because of love. Uh, Let's be honest it's always here. that reason, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's always love. <laughs> But of course, I had that opportunity that, um, you know, I could turn this into a business and do it full time. I mean, I've got my training experience, so, mm. uh, and I love the training aspect of it. So um, I just thought I have to do this, you know, it's, it's an opportunity, I'm going to take it. So Sophie, over here in the West, who are some of the people you work for then? Um, clients are very mixed. It's mainly professional development. Um, so corporate, education, you know, teachers, executives, keynote speakers as well. I do have a product where it's kind of like a body language audit. So I'll audit um, via video footage, uh, feedback to them and then coach them based on that, on where they need coaching. Um, healthcare services. But then again, I have private clients as well. Uh, I mean, body language, it's, it's really the same skills ac across the board. I mean, the, there are some differences, say, for love and romance would be certain cues that you'd be identifying. So there are slight differences. So I do have some people that mm. come to me for that. Um, and I do have a lot of private clients that come for confidence as well. Okay, yeah. Um, and that is something that I really empathize mm. with because when I was young, probably into my early 20s, I was really, really shy. I just think now, you know, if I'd have known some of the things that I know now, <laughs> I just could have got over that as a kid. 
Um, and I'm especially interested now in developing programs for children, who, or children that um, kind of feel vulnerable, you know, uh, those ones that are prone to being bullied, okay, uh, because yeah. there's all kind of things that they could just do with the bodies that would make them look less vulnerable. You had to tell me about, what are some of the myths in body language? Oh, what are some of the things yeah. we think we know, but we maybe don't know? Well, I'll ask you, what, do you, what have you heard about? Okay, well, when, when you said love, the first thing that came to mind was girls playing with their hair. Yeah. I remember hearing that, thinking, okay, that's, you know. Well, uh, that can be a flirting cue. Flirting cue, and also, say if someone, you're talking to someone like I'm talking to you now, and you start mimicking my posture or my mirroring. hand mirroring, that's it. So um, that means they, that they're comfortable with you. I don't know how true yeah, that is. Yeah, that's true too. Um, now, there was a movie, or not a movie, there was a TV show called Lie to Me, and they used to say, um, pulling the ear was you lying someone if they're playing with their ear they're not telling the truth and we had a we had a prime minister back in the 80s you wouldn't remember a guy called bob hawk everyone from australia would remember bob hawk and he was renowned for pulling his ear and i remember a long time after people saying oh that was when they showed parts that they realized afterwards they might have been lying and that might have been a cue don't know if that how true that one is uh well it's a pacifier so people would tend to do that when they're stressed and generally if we're if we're lying then we are stress because it's a lot of cognitive effort on the brain to lie and um, hide your lie, conceal it. Yeah. Um, so that might increase, but a lot of other things were like so self-soothing would possibly increase as well, but it's not a lying cue as such. You can't say, oh, he's touched his ear, he's lying. There's no Pinocchio's nose okay. in lie detection. So it's that with probably other things. Now, I actually, one I do remember, I love to know, looking up. And whether you're looking yes, up to the left yes. or to the right, or looking down to the right or to the uh -huh, left, and what the difference that means. That's but, definitely a myth. Um, so, but that's one thing that, you know, if you ask people about um, body language, you'll say, oh yeah, I know the eye direction, you can tell if you're lying. Um, most people think that, but it's, no, it's a myth. Because I remember when that came about, and it was, um, I think it was back in the 90s that I heard it, and it was based on a um, Princess Lady Di interview. Um, and I think she'd been looking to the left or the right and they were saying, oh, she, you know, she was lying. Um, so with that, um, you know, we do look to the left and right if we're either recalling information or creating information. And this is where that myth comes from. It's kind of like you're making something up, you're creating. But the fact is that people look differently. So it's never, it can never be a cue because one person might do it one way, another person might do it another. Plus, you mm. might be thinking creatively, but not necessarily thinking of a lie. Okay, yeah. So, um, complete myth. And another one that's similar to that is um, eye contact. Um, so there was initially a myth that said that people avoid eye contact when they're lying. Some people, maybe they do, but other people look more, um, you know, so create more eye contact. So again, that's another myth. And I guess that also come down to, like you said before, like when you were shy, you probably didn't want to look people in the eye because you didn't feel confident in looking someone in the eye. Yeah. And I know from my work, um, Aboriginal people don't like to look people in the eye. Yes, it's very and so cultural I've, as well. Yeah, I've been very conscious when I've been doing jobs for, um, in that area to, to not, because I love doing eye contact, yeah. but I've just got to avoid it to a certain, and I can sort of get the cue from the person that I'm really talking to if they're yeah. feeling comfortable or not feeling comfortable when I'm doing yeah. that. Yeah, it's definitely cultural. Some cultures are actually, um, you know, they're taught when they're young, you know, to respect and help by not looking up as much as, and especially I, th I think if they're, um, you know, if, if they've done something wrong and they've, they've been told off for it, you know, to avoid this eye contact as a sign of respect. So it's, it's very different in our culture as well. You know, if you, if you don't make um, eye contact in those situations, then you could be reprimanded for that. So what tips would you give then to the average person out there when they're going for a job interview or just working with their colleagues or friends and family? Um, so one of the best tips, this has worked for me personally, um, and, and of course this is great for people who need that confidence, is power posing. I don't know if you've heard of power no. posing. Anyone heard of power posing out there? Uh, they've all heard of it, but I haven't. Anyway, we'll move on. Um, so Amy Cuddy has got a popular TED talk. Now she mentioned it. A lot of people have heard about power posing through Amy Cuddy. Um, and one of her studies actually shows that when we do power pose, which is when we make ourselves bigger than we are, so it's, this is me, if I extend my arms, then I'm obviously making myself bigger than I, I am. So of course you could do that standing up, sitting down, it's just, you know, expanding yourself. Okay. So one of her studies shows that, um, you know, through saliva testing, that it actually increases testosterone, which is our strength hormone. 
and reduces cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Ah. So okay. if so, if I'm going all large and big here, man, here, here we go. Absolutely. The, oh yeah, you do. I, actually, I can goes. feel it. I can do actually feel it. You do yeah. feel more. I feel more relaxed. I feel yeah, more empowered. But if you come a bit more up, yeah. So uh, of course, if you were in certain situations, like if you're going into an interview, you, you wouldn't go in like this. <laughs> it's too socially aggressive, yeah. uh, as, if, as is this one, hands on hips. Okay. They're both socially aggressive and, and they're where you're going to um, get the most power. Um, so there's this thing called the body, body brain feedback loop. And what, hap what they've found is that what we do with our bodies or how we express with our faces can actually trigger something in the brain that makes us feel that. So, I mean, we already know that when we're feeling an emotion, we express it with our face. So the reverse is true as well. If we express an emotion with our face, even if we're not feeling that emotion, it will trigger something and we'll start to feel that emotion. So the same with the power posing. Because this is like a confidence stance, when you do it, you actually feel that confidence. It, yeah. it gives you strength, really, which is what we want before we go into something important. I mean, well, we want this all the time, of course, mm. but especially important if we're going for an interview or something like that. So the tip is to um, pre-power pose before you go in, so make yourself as, as big as you po possibly can. Um, I used to do this if I was driving somewhere, you know, in a stop at the lights, drape my arm on the passenger side, so I'm getting that on my way there, I'm getting that um, testosterone increase. Um, and then once I get there, of course, I don't want to be going in and looking aggressive, but I can maintain that stance by doing um, a launch stance, which is f feet firmly planted on the floor, um, shoulders back, um, chest, chin, and forehead kind of pointed upwards, but not too much. You don't want to look superior. Yeah. Um, just so it's just a confidence stance, and this maintains that feeling of confidence. And they've actually done studies. This How is so doing? interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Looking good, Courtney. <can't> <laughs> so they've done studies where they've had people pre-power posing before an interview, mm -hmm. um, and the other group didn't. You know, they all prepared for the interview, but one group actually pre-power pose as well. Um, and the people that were interviewing them um, said, "Yeah, we'd we'd rather employ these people," and they were the people that had power posed beforehand. Wow. Okay. So it's it just doing it beforehand gets the right mix happening, and then you're ready, and then you and then little ways to maintain it. Yeah. So as soon as you cross back into low power pose, like as soon as I cross over, I'm having the reverse mm. effect. Okay. So I start to lose that feeling of strength. So you need to maintain it. Now crossing arms. We all heard yep. about crossing arms yes. as being defensive uh -huh. and you know holding things in. Is that true? Or is that, that can be true. Uh, see, that's another thing that yeah. most people think of. It can be true, but um, there's also evidence that you know some people think. Uh, cross their arms when they're thinking or they're cold yeah so it depends <laughs> on context as well it's not always the case but you also did a nice little tilt there when you did it like a bit of attitude you know that oh, way. Did I? Yeah, you did the shoulder <laughs> up i don't know okay so animal examples you've got some animal examples for me what have you got yes another tip is a head tilt um, so people at head tilt come across as being a more empathetic um, more approachable. So is that, that this warm. type of thing or that type of thing? Or yeah, this... well, I've probably got one now because I always seem to have one. Okay. Can you Well, you know, you, you look reasonably well because oh, you, okay. your body's turned anyway, <laughs> turned, yeah, so yeah. it's a bit probably hard to see if it, but you do look quite straight to me. Oh, okay, all but right. Maybe I'm tilted the same way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the head tilt, it's, it's kind of like a sign of active listening. Well, that, that dog is yeah. a classic one, isn't uh -huh, it? Uh-huh, it is, isn't it? So when you, know, you hear a strange noise, someone says, did you hear that? Often we'll kind of get our ear out like this. Yeah, like that's making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but people actually do this when they're conversing with other people, when they're actively listening. So often, like, you, know, you, you know, someone's telling you a story and you're kind of listening intently like this. So it's a sign that you're actively listening. Uh, and the other people, it makes the other person feel much more comfortable. Mm, it makes yeah. you look warmer as well. Yeah. Now, interestingly, um, I saw a clip of Lady Di just recently. And I mean, back then I wasn't, I, I didn't know everything that, I know now about body language, but as soon as I saw, saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, she's like, her head was like this, but everybody loved her. You know, she, uh, people thought she was so warm and approachable. Um, and looking at it now, I'm thinking, 
pretty sure that was mainly because of the head tilt. And that was very much Lady Di. Oh, bless her. I haven't seen a picture of her for ages. No. So have a look at these two pictures here. So it shows empathy and engagement. You can kind of feel it when you look at these pictures. You know, these are people that are listening. Well, I mean, that's a beautiful one there because a doctor, I imagine the lady yeah. on the right is a doctor. That's mm -hmm. what I'm sort of guessing. And that is, yeah, empathy and engagement. Perfectly done there. But I mean, that's, that's probably been so well orchestrated. That's one of those perfect sort of um, clip art pictures, isn't it? Of, um, it is, that you but see in windows. start to notice this when you talk to people and you, you know, you will see it. Now have a look at this one. So if we can compare these two and think about in terms of warmth and approachability, which one looks more approachable and, and warmer to you? The one on the right, but I'll also say it's to do with the lighting as well on that. But here I am, I guess, as a filmmaker looking at it, actually yes. the lighting's a lot brighter on it too. Yeah. So when yeah. you say there's more than one factor, there is always more than one factor in that. Whereas she's got nice subtle lighting on her with the tones in her face, mm -hmm. the warmth even in her face looks warm because of the lighting and the, the shades and the contrast. Whereas the one on the left, very overexposed on it. So you... It looks a bit more kind of like um, straight down the line kind yeah. of thing, doesn't it? But then her face tells me something else, even though you can see that case well, straight. Got... If she probably wasn't as smiling as much, it would be the extreme. But seeing it, it's like the smile brings it back enough for me. Yeah, to it was want to well, that smile, interestingly, is um, more of a genuine smile, and the other one is more of a polite smile. Yeah. So that should counteract. I mean, to me, the one with a head tilt definitely feels warmer. But, but you're, despite you're, yeah. the it being a polite smile and not a genuine smile. It, it, you know, you say that, it doesn't look as true, does it? That mm. smile looks a bit faker than yeah. the other one on yeah. the left. Yeah, so they've both got different bits happening to them, but have they got enough of who would you go with more? I guess probably still is the one on the right, isn't it? Even though the smile isn't as genuine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, there's enough other things that make it more pleasant. Yeah. Ah, yeah, very interesting. So. And a smile is interesting as well. The difference between a genuine smile and a polite smile. When we, I mean, we all smile um, mm. to be polite, which is better than not smiling. Of course, <laughs> it's a whole lot better. But when we smile, it's a polite smile. It's just a smile without a mouth. But when we do a genuine smile, these upper cheek muscles are engaged. Ah. So, you know, we see the lines underneath and the, the crow's feet. Um, but the thing is, like, only one in ten people can fake a genuine smile. Okay. Now, think back to the body-brain feedback loop, the, the facial um, feedback hypothesis, which is that if um, we express something in our face, we can trigger that emotion. So if we know this, then of course we want to trigger happiness in ourselves. Um, so there is a tip that you can force these muscles to activate, <laughs> uh, and that's if you put a pen in between your teeth uh, for a, um, like a minute or two. And what happens when you put the pen between your teeth and you pull your top and bottom lips back is these upper cheek muscles actually activate and it triggers that feeling of happiness. That's a lot of effort to get a, a, a genuine smile. <laughs> Couldn't you just think of something happy? <laughs> yes, that's another way. That's, well, that would be the first way. But what if, you, if you're really not feeling happy? Like, and you then, can't get it. The, the, the no. Last resort, put the pen in your teeth yeah. and grit down on the pen yeah. for a couple of minutes and, and then it'll teeth, generate. your lips back. Top and bottom. Yeah, that's and it. Then yeah. down. And maybe you're one of those one in ten. <laughs> <laughs> but so my tip generally is mm. to people because we do when we genuinely smile, it looks so much better. Um, mm. Presenters that do genuine smiles once in a while, when um, in in terms of what they're saying, of course it has to be like applicable to what they're saying. Uh, if they do that genuine smile in those moments, then they come across much, they're rated higher as a presenter. Um, you know, so if we, we do this, then my tip would be to have, um, have something in your head that's kind of like a go-to happiness memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah. think of that, and if that doesn't work, then you know, try to trigger that happiness before you go into something. Obviously, you don't want to go into something with a <laughs> pen in your mouth, but you could do it beforehand, like the pre-power posing. Yeah, I like that. Because, I, I mean, as a filmmaker, we'd always notice, if you, you know, so much talk, when you talk about someone who's having a good smile, you can see the smiles in their eyes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where that comes from. Yeah. So that leads us on to another point, turtling. Tell me about turtling. What's oh, that? Oh, turtling is really interesting. So, so we looked at the head tilt and, um, and we saw that in the dog, um, and also in the humans, because there's a lot of um, nonverbal communication that's universal, so it's across all cultures. Um, and also in animals as well. So, you know, we share a lot of the same behaviors. Now, turtling is one that you see a lot in humans and in animals. So turtling is when our shoulders go up and our head sinks into oh, okay. us. And it's okay. kind of like 
hiding in the open. So if you say you're sitting around a table with a group of kids and like, you know, who's eating the cookies? Look for the one that uh, <laughs> that's your answer. And kids are more prone, pronounced, so I guess, do this than adults if you have well, a... Well, absolutely, because a... as we get older, we kind of, we hide these cues. So when you look at a, a kid doing a nonverbal cue, it, it feels more exaggerated, like eye blocking, you know, they cover their eyes. Whereas mm. um, a, a, an adult, I nearly said a human then, <laughs> an adult will kind of, I block with their eyelashes. Okay. I mean, they, they still might do this if they hear bad news or something, but um, we kind of, we're trying to conceal those emotions. But still subtly do it in a way like you're just closing yeah. the eyes a little so bit. So it or... still happens, it's just yeah. much more subtle. Okay. Mm. Um, so totally, I've got some great examples yeah, here. Let's have do you remember at... um, Miss Universe last year? And they announced no, the... I can't say I did. <laughs> Watch that, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realise that was going to be one of the questions that I needed to get background on Miss Universe. But anyway, <laughs> show me Miss Universe. What have we got? Right, so what happened was Steve Harvey was the host and he announced the winner and, and he happened to announce the wrong winner. Oh, I do remember that scenario now that comes right. back to it. Yes. Okay, good. So look at this picture here and compare the two. So this picture here is um, Steve Harvey as his baseline. So this is how he normally is. You know, mm -hmm. his shoulders are down. This one is when he comes back out to announce that he's made a mistake and the winner is not oh. the winner so you can clearly see there that his head's kind of sunk into his yeah. shoulders so that's a, um, a human example neck. of turtling yes his neck is gone and he's, he's so he's actually you can really see he's brought his shoulders yeah, up he aren't comes they? out he walks onto yeah. the stage like this so I mean I can see things like that but the majority of people probably wouldn't notice mm. um, so, which is why when you can put them together like that you know it's clear much clearer to see but we notice it but in a subconscious way as well we do absolutely okay. yeah and that's the thing about nonverbal communication that's why it's so powerful because um, even though we're not conscious of what we're seeing we definitely pick that up on a subconscious level and we might not be aware of that but that is driving our behavior you know if we don't feel quite right about somebody or some something that they've done we can we can feel it and that might stop us from behaving in a certain way so I have some great examples of animals doing this as well I've got some YouTube clips here so you can see there, uh, I mean, of course, the, the walk on all fours for so different shape, but you can see kind of the head's gone down. Their version of turtling is kind of sneaking out, kind of hiding in the open, doesn't want to be caught out with that. Actually, Darwin first wrote about how um, humans and animals express emotion in the same way. I mean, um, it, it was very kind of rough research, and, and some of it is true. So if we look at this picture of a cat, um, can you see how their eyes are widened? Yeah. Well, when we express fear, fear is one of the seven universal micro-expressions, which are across all cultures. So when we express fear, our eyebrows go up uh, and we can see, you know, we can usually see the tops of the whites of the eyes because our eyes are so wide open. Uh, and w the reason that we do that is because we're ready. We c it's kind of like we freeze and we're ready to either um, to fight or flight. Okay. Um, so we're trying to get as much view of everything as we can, you know, to what is this threat, to kind of figure out what's going on. So our eyes raise. We're try trying to get our eyebrows out, out of the way. And if you look at the cat as well, kind of the ears kind of pushed aside. It's probably doing the same thing there. And so you can it's see it's, gone back. Yeah, yeah, its eyes are wide open. So um, it, it, you can tell from the cat that it's expressing that fear. So once you become familiar with these universal expressions, you know, you, uh, and nonverbal communication, they want the part that's universal. You, you can start to detect this in animals too. And it's kind of so much easier to understand them. And that's how they understand us as well. Sophie, we've just had our federal election. Now that's gotta be a good time to check out body language. What have you noticed in our federal Australian election? Oh, it's so interesting, politics and body language. Um, well, let me tell you about the Nixon-Kennedy debate first, which was in the 1960s. So this is a first televised presidential uh, debate. Um, and it's important in terms of nonverbal communication history because it was a turning point because the opinions of the nation were divided because, um, you know, they had the debate on TV, but also people listened, a lot of people listened on the radio. Many people didn't have TVs. So what happened was that those people that listened on the radio were convinced that Nixon was going to win, and those that saw it on TV were convinced that Kennedy was going to win. And just this divide was like, 
oh my gosh, like what's happening? How can this be? This has never happened. Donations have never been so divided. Yeah. So what was actually happening was Nixon came across quite strong with like his vocal power over the radio. And on the video, um, he's, you know, on TV, his non-verbals were pretty negative. Um, we can have a look at this picture here. And on the other hand, Kennedy came across brilliantly on TV and his voice wasn't, wasn't perhaps as strong as Nixon's on the radio. But just from what you can see there, you can see that Nixon is in what we call the runner's stance. So can you see one leg's in front yeah. of the other? Yeah, okay. Uh, and that, um, we will be in the runner's stance if we basically want to take off. Okay, so you're not so, comfortable, you're ready to go. He's, yeah. he's ready to get up so and go. So that's not really something we'd look for in a leader. Now a bit of background behind this, Nixon had been ill. He'd lost a lot of weight. I think he'd been in hospital as well. So you can see there that his suit looks like it's too big for him. Yeah. yeah. Kennedy looks much smarter, the way he's dressed, and he looks much healthier. Uh, Kennedy had agreed to stage makeup. Nixon refused it. So there are all these little factors that were at play there. Now, can you also see where Nixon's looking? Well, he's looking straight at Kennedy. He is, and yeah. this is something we, you know, we, we always look to our superiors to see what their reactions are. And ah. when we have a look at the video, you know, it, it, it seems too long. He's just looking at Kennedy, and it just feels wrong. Feels awkward. Yeah, it and feels Kennedy really looks awkward. so posed there, doesn't he? He does, yeah, and he just sits there very still. Very, I mean, he's got his hands kind of like this, which could be a sign of vulnerability, which would be normal, I guess. Um, but Nixon also looks a bit fidgety. Watch him fidget around a bit. Oh yes, he's scratching his hands, his hands, whereas Kennedy hasn't even moved, has he? He even flashed a, a micro, a expression of contempt then as well, which is okay, let's see that hatred again. and disdain. So look, when it zooms in on Nixon, you kind of like a, a one-sided smile, but it's not a smile, it's, it's contempt, which is hatred or disdain. Oh, this at the start, there, there's that little thing mm -hmm. with his mouth, Just doesn't a one-sided. Okay, very yeah. interesting. Okay, so that's our background. So this is where body language really started to sort of get used and... Yeah. Or used is probably not the best word to say. Uh, but. Well, people started to take notice and yeah. investigate it because it put so much fear into people that there wasn't a, they didn't have another televised presidential de debate for another 16 years. Okay. That's how scared people were because they knew it was having a huge impact and they didn't understand it, so they wanted to avoid it. So that was kind of at the time when um, research had started looking more into body language and people paid more attention to it. So bringing it home to Australia in the last couple of weeks, I've seen you comment on this, this picture recently, so tell me more about it. So Bill Shorten has been driving me crazy because he's just not showing trust to people. Our biggest trust indicators are our hands. Now, so they've done um, research where they've tracked eye movement, and what they've found is the first place we look when we look at somebody approaching is the hands. Okay. So basically, they're looking really, and this is, so think of this from an evolutionary perspective. <laughs> you must be hiding something there, don't they? <laughs> so from an evolutionary perspective, they're looking to see, is this person approaching a friend or a foe? Do they have a weapon in the hand? Okay, yes. So interestingly, we still look at the hands. Uh, most people would assume it's the face or the eyes, but no, we look at the hands. So in Bill Shorten's ads, he just doesn't show his hands. You know, he's often cut off from here. Um, so if we don't see someone's hands, like if they're in the pockets or under the table or something, um, we kind of feel like we can't trust that person. And of course, one of the key things you want people, especially in politics, um, you know, to, to take from you is that element of trust. And we, haven't, we don't feel like we've got that. Okay, so we'll compare that one to these two pictures you have here of um, Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah, now this is from one, these are screenshots from one of his um, ad campaigns. So this ad campaign, you know, it's, it looks too fake with his hands, what he's doing. He looks like he's practiced it too much. And I know he uses his hands to express, which is great. By the end of it, it kind of looks like he's doing some bell ringing. <laughs> Well, it's almost, it no, seems it like he has wrong. been directed, okay, these lines say with this hand, these lines yeah. say with this mm -hmm. hand, then back to yeah. this hand. It's it giving him a, maybe authentic. it's giving him a beat to walk or something on, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? It's like he's, like, he's doing a, a bit of drumming or let's watch it again. So when we fake these expressive hand gestures or, or any nonverbal communication, you know, when we fake it too much, it just looks inauthentic. So it's good at the beginning, this one, and I think the director probably went, okay, keep going, but he should have just 
said okay now that's yeah, it now just, yeah. now just walk it's just like it's overused <coughs> and it just makes it look inauthentic mm. and, and you know I know he uses his hands generally so why he's not doing it in a more natural way you know I mm. liked it at the beginning but I think then the shot just needed to come into a tighter one where almost the hands went out of shot so yeah. it can start off there mm-hmm. but then you can come in here because it gets more personal yes, as you come in yeah. closer and I think that would have then maybe got rid of him looking silly. Yeah, yeah. Because he just looks like he's being a drummer boy, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Marching, marching, marching. Now, another thing I noticed when I ha- was having a look at the screenshots, so these two screenshots and all the screenshots that I took of it to get the right ones to show you, his face is actually expressing sadness. You know, his mouth is downturned. Yeah. Um, when we express sadness, and that's sadness is supposed to be the hardest expression to fake. Our eyebrow, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people can do it, but they go our, down. Our, it's kind of like they go oblique, so they kind of go like that. Okay. So you can see that subtly on him. Like he looks sad in those photos, and this is how. I mean, how we're going to be picking this up on a subconscious level, but this, if this is what he's expressing, you know, this is what we're picking up. Yeah, well, you have captured beautifully in that screenshot on the left there. That definitely looks very sad. I mean, it's just. I mean, I can even see it in that one, it, even that his mouth's open, so it's less detectable, mm. but it, it's still his eyebrows are that shape. I mean, it's just unfortunate for him that he's ex- expre- he expresses this in his face. It might just be his face. He might not be <laughs> feeling genuinely sad, but we're picking up that yeah. there's sadness there. But it could have happened something beforehand, right could before we filmed this. Got yep. a bit of bad news about mm-hmm. something and had to go do Absolutely. this video. I thought, oh, yeah. well, I'm going to be doing hundreds of these because he's on the TV constantly, yeah. so I didn't think too much about it. And, and off they went because they're on the time. To, you know, got to get things done. They're yeah, in a rush. Yeah. Got to get it done. We can't, we can't wait for you to be happy. Come on. Come on, Malcolm. Off you go. Out you come. Which leads me nicely then into, okay, it's all about me, you see, Sophie. My body language. What have you noticed? Um, so generally, I think you, you're all got nothing to worry about. You, you're pretty <laughs> expressive with your hands, which is great, especially for people, you know, that um, you know, are presenting. They've actually found that people that present more, you know, is, is color correlated in the same way so those people that express more with their hands are rated higher um you know the science of people did a study where they had a look at um the most popular ted talks and the least popular so the hand gestures in that went up now um i have analyzed some of your videos that's okay go 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 forward go Um, forward and i found some really interesting points that i wanted to show you so one of which is your hand gestures there's one point where you express brilliantly Mm. Um, so what we call them purposeful hand gestures. So purposeful hand gestures are those that actually bring meaning to your words. So, um, for example, if you're showing something that's getting bigger or something coming together, something that's going like outward, something that's coming inward. So we're literally expressing our words with our hands. So it's two levels of com- communication. You know, you've got your words and they're in sync with your gestures. Um, so they've found that when people use their hands more, um, the, the receiver understands it better, you know, they can interpret it better, and also they have better recall, so they can recall it later on, because they've seen this, uh, seen and heard this um, through two means of communication. Okay. So you did a brilliant example of that. We're all sitting there like the seven hours with the camera, we're all sitting there with our lathes and our chisels and our hammers and yes. going, yeah. what do I, what do, I do? I've got, I've got it. I've, I bought them. Where do I start banging here and slicing there? And you doing see, that? that's communication on two and levels. Your hand gestures are perfect. And I'm sure I'm not alone there. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I guess that is a, a, that is an important thing to sort of like here I am because I'm explaining yeah, it. I guess is it yeah. maybe because I have kids or something? You got to show them what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. Banging, I'm banging, I'm banging. I'm chiseling. Did you like my chiseling? Did it look like chiseling or <laughs> or, sli- or planing? Was that that planing? Is that planing or ironing? What am I doing? I'm ironing now. <laughs> So that is an important thing. Um, Absolutely. Well, I do know for videos, it's great to... Well, one thing I learned from a director a long time ago was if you've got a point, whatever the point is of that video, yeah. if you can get that point in the video three times, then people retain it. Right. If you only got the point in there once and that's and it's the key point, then they won't retain that. But mm-hmm. if they hear it three times mm-hmm. throughout the video, yeah. not obviously right after each yes. other, but if you can get it back again, then back again, again, then they'll walk away with that point at least. Yeah, well, it's exactly the same with training. You know, you need to get that information across in many ways. It's not going to be retained if you just give it um, just once. But which, the, which is why this makes sense because, I mean, it's two levels of communication. You're saying it twice in one go, and of yeah. course it would have to be repeated again. 
for it to be retained yeah. at some point. But this is why purposeful hand gestures are great. Uh, as long as you, you know, you need to keep it within this box, within this area. I mean, occasionally you could come out if you're saying something's getting bigger, for example. Uh, but when people start expressing like this, it makes us look a bit disorganized and a bit scatty. So, you, you know, you want to look more controlled. You don't want it out of the box. There, there is a point where it gets mm -hmm. goes against you. You've got to have it to only a yes. certain level. If you do it too much, then you're just weird and wacky. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, and then, yeah, we've got some other really interesting things that you show. Um, the one-sided shoulder shrug, that was at 52 seconds into the clip. Um, so with a one sh when we do a double shoulder shrug, it's kind of like absolute, you know, this is what we mean, we, we, you know, we're saying what we mean. When we do a one-sided shoulder shrug... Is it watch this space sort of thing and see if things change or what could change or what, how could, what difference it could make or what... Yeah, that's all so right could there. you see that it, you weren't quite sure what you were asking, you were trying to arrive at what you were asking. Um, which shows that you didn't have confidence in your words. Of course, you do this one-sided shoulder shrug. So it can be seen as a um, deception cue if it's seen with other cues at the same time mm. be because it's showing that you don't have confidence in your words. In that context, of course, you were just trying to get your words out. So you can, I, could see, I could see the clogs turning over my head there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, my wife says that a lot. She goes, you can see, I, can see you, you, I can see it all happening. It's trying to, you're trying to get it out, trying to work yeah. it out. Um, and that's it, the one sided shoulder shrug. I never knew it. Yep. And there was also a brilliant example of mirroring. So, this was when you were talking to Mark Horwood. Oh, Mark, yeah. Okay. Which is in the Faroe Islands, and no idea where the Faroe Islands was. <laughs> Did you say <see> yeah. that? <laughs> that's so. Well, of course, you were completely unaware that you were doing it, but you know, you're showing there that you've got this affinity with him and you're really listening intently, and you know, you. So much so that you start to mirror him naturally. You've looked at such detail there. I would have never have seen that. Yeah, he's gone like that, and then I've just done it. It's like, yeah, a, yeah. It's like a little wave of it happening. But it, it, that was weird because watching it kind of made me feel like I should be doing it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you might have shoulder shrugged yourself? Oh, that is so funny. Oh, beautiful. Now, I was saying to you earlier about um, Mark Howard. So his topic isn't something that I'd usually be interested in listening to, but he's very engaging and that's just because of his, how he comes across non-verbally. So when we do the right non-verbal communication, you know, the positive stuff, then, um, you know, people want to watch us become more engaging, which is why it's really important, especially for, you know, executives, keynote speakers, etc. Or topics that might be very dry. Especially, that, yeah. yes, of course, yeah. So this one, um, I think you say that was very inspiring, but when you do it, you, you touch your heart. So it's like literally coming from the heart. Your passion, Natasha. I love it. I, I, um, I'm lucky. It's inspiring. See, it's inspiring. I wish I had this kind of passion. Look at your beautiful smile. You love talking about it. I just can't, I can't shut you up. No. <laughs> No, I, I mean, obviously that. you weren't doing yeah. that. You weren't conscious that you would let me put my hand to my heart kind of thing. Mm. But, you know, it mm. just shows that that's kind of in a cross and it's genuine. I can, I can remember that moment now. It, it, she was inspiring. She was yeah. very inspiring. Yeah. I mean, was, and also, there, there's the example of someone smiling with her eyes. Her eyes mm. just lit up when she smiled. Yeah. And you want to you smile with yeah. her because yeah. she has these gorgeous eyes when she smiles. Um, and that's what I'm getting with the passion because she was involved and getting involved yes, in it. Yeah. And, and, you can, and I can feel it as even I'm doing it. You, you, you can almost feel the rush come up your cheeks mm -hmm. when you do a, a proper yeah. smile, can't you? You can always feel it coming up Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Compared to just, yes, normal. Yes, yes, I'm smiling to be polite. And it's just, there's nothing. It's dead up here. So if you have Botox, I wonder how that works then. Ah, Botox. Interesting. So uh, it depends where you have Botox. So if you have it around this area here, then... Um, they've done research where they've found that those people stop feeling that happiness. You know, they can't feel it as much okay. because these, these bits have kind of been frozen kind of yeah. thing. So we could, it's just, just like not being able to trigger that emotion. So they don't get the sensation no, of a happy don't, smile. Not in the same way, no. But I've also heard that I think if you have it kind of in this area here, you know, to stop frowning, then um, of course that might make you feel more positive because you're not frowning. Okay, same, of course, so just do frowning. it up here, but don't do it down here. Is that the tip? <laughs> <laughs> what 
<laughs> or just don't do it at all. We love the lines. Leave the lines. Lines are great. Well, our, the lines in our face tell a lot about our lives, don't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. It's part of the beauty. Well, Sophie, thank you so much for coming and chatting to us about body language and giving us some tips and hope You're it's welcome. been useful for everybody watching. And it's been delightful just talking about it and learning a little bit more and I'll try to put a little bit more in practice. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Till next time. Bye for now.